So welcome once again to the Internal Medicine uh, Grand Rounds. We're lucky to have one of our own, Dr. David Taubin, here to talk to us today. Um, just to tell you a little bit about his history, following his philosophy degree from Yale, he started his medical journey at Tufts, um, before coming to Seattle to be what I was just told was the second class of the primary care residency to ever exist, uh, which means that he's a better person than I am just in general. Uh, <laughs> he finished his residency here and since since his arrival, he started climbing through the ranks of the internal medicine department before transitioning to the division of pain medicine within the Department of Anesthesiology. He became chief there, uh, chief of that division in 2013, and last year, he was named to the Hughes M. and Catherine G. Blake Endowed uh, Professorship in Health Psychology. He's lectured nationally and serves on national boards for several interest groups, all focused on pain medicine and education around pain medicine. He's often the only internist serving on these boards. He also has served or ser has served as the uh, PI on multiple NIH-funded studies of pain control, symptom management, and palliative care. He's even had several TV uh, <laughs> appearances as an expert on these topics. He similarly published on both pain medicine and education on pain medicine, and within our program, he teaches at all levels, from medical students up through the fellowship, and he's consistently named as one of the top docs on both the national and local level. So it is my pleasure to listen to Dr. Taubin teaching us about the intersection of primary care and pain. Thank you very much. That was very flattering. Uh, now my problem is I'm going to have to live up to that, uh, those accolades. Well, I'll, I'll try my best. And uh, I just want to uh, start out with a quick survey of this room. Uh, I think it's going to be overwhelmingly clear uh, by when I take, ask this quick question. So the question is, how many? in this room uh, are absolutely delighted when they see a patient with chronic pain appearing on their uh, schedule. Okay. I always get one outlier on this one. Okay. Why? It pulls together all aspects of You're a philosopher, too. I love it. So it does pull together all All right. So uh, I'm going to go through some, uh, first off, no financial uh, uh, concerns uh, and uh, uh, worries about me going out of line here. Uh, you can uh, basically go through, I'm going to go through the objective. I'm going to start by, I think one of my objectives is at the end of this, uh, a few of you, maybe one or two, particularly at the training years, uh, will actually feel like I did, which was that these were the most satisfying and gratifying patients I saw in my primary care practice, which led to my shift. Uh, because if you understand pain and you understand how to take care of patients with pain, uh, you can actually do a lot. And we're going to walk through the story uh, here. So the objectives are to understand why, without any education, without any time to take care of these patients, and with no access to the tools you need, uh, we've done a bad job managing pain. I think that's uh, oxymoron right there. Uh, Overreliance on opioids has been a, a, a national disaster. Uh, we do have uh, an uh, education program called Telepain, and I would invite you all to talk a little bit about how we increase access to getting specialty, multidisciplinary specialty consultation. Uh, and I think uh, as a person uh, familiar with chronic disease management, because uh, I did 27 years in, in a private practice, uh, general internal medicine uh, setting, uh, and I see some of my, two of my colleagues from my practice here sitting here uh, in Seattle, uh, I do understand uh, triple aim, and I think pain actually fits exactly into this uh, because of the uh, complexity of the disease and the need to be able to manage this in an understandable fashion. I'm going to discuss a little bit about how you measure it, I don't, certainly don't have enough time, uh, but it's not the fifth vital sign uh, in any useful fashion. I'll do a bit of explaining about that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the national pain strategy, uh, which is something I'm going to have an ask from all of you to take a look at it and offer comments. I'll, I'll introduce this, but that's a whole separate uh, discussion. Uh, and then uh, introduce the fact that one of the pain societies is looking for internists to join the shared interest group. And I'm making the a straight out pitch for people to be potentially interested uh, for reasons we'll, we'll get to. Uh, so uh, Mike von Korf over at Group Health coined the term flying blind, and I think it's a great term to describe uh, where we are all at, uh, I'd say all specialties of medicine, uh, because, uh, and this is a survey done uh, by uh, O'Rourke and uh, also by Upshur, uh, identified in 500 academic primary care practices, so these are the teachers, most of this room here, uh, actually felt uh, unprepared uh, themselves to manage this manage pain problem. Uh, uh, 81 plus percent of attending physicians rated their own medical school education and residency as poor. I would say that was my experience. Uh, Tufts was a great medical school. I learned zero 
about pain as a medical student. Uh, and I, our uh, advanced practice colleagues, uh, nurse practitioners and physicians assistants on a zero to five score were kind not to give it a zero, but they gave it a 0 0.5. So uh, this is a, a, a very pervasive uh, problem. Uh, and as uh, uh, Scott Fishman, uh, who, who's coming next week to Anesthesia Grand Rounds, the ungodly hour is 6.30 in the morning, uh, but you're welcome to come. And Scott has uh, led a national education, uh, and I've been very fortunate to be able to work with him. And I quote, the problem is simply that most doctors aren't well prepared to manage pain, and who enjoys doing something that they aren't trained to do? And I think that is the, the answer to the problem that we all have. Uh, Beth Murrinson uh, at uh, Hopkins has done uh, a lot of seminal work in identifying the problem with, with education uh, in uh, the United States and in Canada, and actually has done some national surveys. A lot of data on this. The, the bottom line is there's a median of seven hours of education in four years of medical school when she did this, did this survey back in, actually it was conducted 2009. The University of Washington at that point had six hours uh, when I joined the, the uh, uh, active faculty here. Uh, a lot of time spent on pharmacology, which is of course important uh, to know. Uh, I was surprised to see that there was actually pediatric uh, pain education training as well, uh, and some palliative care, a little bit on assessment. So there's a bit of a spread. Uh, you can see that our Canadian colleagues aren't uh, much further off, and actually internationally it's about the same. And this leads uh, a McLean's uh, headliner that since veterinary students get 87 hours of pain education, uh, they get their dogs better cared for than we do our own patients as far as pain is concerned. So what do we know about this from our medical students? I think everyone here knows, and me being a primary care guy to start with, I'm connected to the uh, workforce needs of primary care. Uh, in the Division of uh, Department of Family Medicine, Roger Rosenblatt and uh, uh, Dr. Corrigan in 2011 identified by uh, surveys and diaries of the students who were in the RUOP program, the Rural Underserved Outreach uh, provider program uh, that uh, over 90% of the trainees uh, were highly dissatisfied with the experience of pain. It was the number one dissatisfier. And in fact, large numbers of them in their diaries said that this is the reason they're rethinking going into primary care. They were so disabled by what they were seeing in the practice. They said it, they want nothing of this. They'll go into radiology or something else that might be spare them that, that agony. Uh, part of this, as I mentioned, is uh, you know, curriculum issues. So one slide on education, uh, regular curriculum is something that we work really hard to formulate. It's an arduous task, and I know many are involved in creating curriculum. Uh, that's formal, structured education that follows a sequence that is intended to create specific competencies. Uh, the hidden curriculum is, however, what pervades uh, our experience of pain, again, because uh, our preceptors and faculty don't know much about it, and these patients can be so challenging when we don't know what we're doing. Uh, I quote to one of my colleagues at the uh, General Trial Medicine meetings last year. Uh, she said, yeah, one roll of the eyes undoes 10 hours of carefully constructed curriculum. So the comments we make, the offhand flippant remarks about how much of a pain these pain patients are, they're just drug addicts and seeking and malingering and all that, 10 hours of work that I do in a classroom with medical students is flash undone. So. Uh, uh, it's a big problem, uh, and uh, it is uh, something that uh, I hope by just speaking with you a little today, you'll be a little more sensitive to yourselves. So why is primary care uh, important uh, for people with pain? Well, the bottom line is uh, only 2% of patients actually see a pain specialist. Uh, that means 98% of people are getting care elsewhere. Uh, fairly consistent data from multiple sources support that uh, about 30% of the adult primary care visits involve chronic pain. So that's the average uh, primary care practice. 30% uh, of the patients you see are going to be in, in, uh, uh, involving chronic pain issues. 20% uh, is delivered by emergency departments. I know mean, a lot of folks end up in emergency departments, but another quick survey, who believes that chronic illness is well managed in an emergency department setting? Okay, you all passed. We're good. Uh, and so this is a big problem, uh, of course, because so much of it is being delivered by people who are simply not not trained and don't have access to specialists. Kirk Kroenke uh, through the uh, VA and the VA and DOD has done a huge program over the past five years because of the enormous problem with uh, uh, overuse and overreliance of opiates in that population. Uh, they've done a big launch. Uh, we've been participating in a telemedicine program. Uh, Randy Gray, our uh, esteemed projectionist here, has been very involved in that. I've been working with him now since 2011. 
But uh, he, this editorial uh, from Pain Practice, calling all pain patients telehealth has arrived. And I would say all pain providers, because the model of care we're using is a telementoring uh, program. And there's Randy uh, there on the, on the left. And we're delivering uh, to uh, all of Whammy Land uh, every week uh, for an hour and a half. And we've delivered 5,000 hours of uh, education and about 300 consults, all free, all living on grant. And uh, by the way, about to end at the end of this year when our grant money runs out, because this is not compensated by any system because it's education and it's not patient care, even though we give free consults. This also constitutes a Washington State Department of Health uh, consultation, the requirement if your patient's not doing well on high dose opiates, you can just dial in and you get a multidisciplinary com uh, conversation. Uh, in addition to uh, our, uh, our IT staff, uh, we'll have typically a pediatrician, a uh, rehabilitation medicine doctor, a psychiatrist, uh, Joe Merrill from the department. Uh, he may be connected from Harborview right now this morning. He's our primary care and addiction specialist uh, and an anesthesiologist. Uh, so you get a multidisciplinary consultation. You get to present the case, describe it, and we then, when we say, well, why don't you try this? You can say, man, I tried it, and the patient suicided on it. So we don't actually tell you what to do. You tell us what you've tried and what's worked and we work with folks in a continuous basis. So very, very effective uh, educational program we've been running since 2011. Uh, I had the Carly Simons, haven't got time for pain, and I blew people out of the room, and I've tried it before, so I won't play the little tune. Uh, but this is a, a dose antenna, nice title, and this is the challenge that you face in the clinic. Uh, I present this to uh, pain specialists, uh, and they're astonished that this is what you're up against. I'm not at all, but this is just a you know, misery loves company, just to remind you that we do know uh, from the literature uh, that in the very short visits, 70% uh, of your visits are associated with pain. 70% of your visits patients reporting pain, and that makes sense. It's a lot of hours, and don't worry about it, a little stomach ache that's not related to pain as a disease. Uh, the mean duration of time spent managing pain is less than six minutes. Uh, to sort all this out, and this is in the face of seven other clinical problems per visit. Uh, plus the preventative services that we have to maintain and keep up to date as well, which alone would take seven hours. Uh, so this is an impossible task to be able to uh, evaluate these complicated patients that affect, as we learned, all domains of, uh, of human life. Uh, limited access for frequent follow-ups, adherence monitoring, a big disruption. Uh, you don't trust me. Why are you making me do this? The time and the expense associated with searching this out. Uh, limited or no access to multidisciplinary care, and uh, again, it's a, we resort to opioids as the de facto treatment because that's the fastest and easiest way to get out of the exam room and get to stay on schedule. Uh, in the old days, when I pull my prescription pad out of the pocket, that would you could see the whole visit change. All right, we're done talking. I get my drugs and I can walk out of the room. So it's a quick and easy, easy out from this situation. Uh, this is complicated because there's been a pressure for us to prescribe opiates. This is nothing uh, that's a surprise uh, to the uh, uh, more uh, senior faculty in the room. I think uh, uh, observations of watching younger trainees now astonished by the doses that I wouldn't even have raised my eyebrows at uh, five or six years ago. Uh, but in 1996, uh, the American Pain Society, uh, to perhaps its discredit, said pain should be a fifth vital sign. Uh, and that makes sense in the acute care setting where opiates are incredibly effective in the hospital setting for acute pain. Uh, but in chronic pain, uh, there's frankly no evidence. The NIH just did a big review, published in Annals of Internal Medicine two months ago. Interested in reviewing it. The uh, le level of evidence to support uh, chronic opiate management, particularly at high dose, is absent. It's not even weak. It's just not even present. Uh, uh, J. Coru, Back in 2001, now the Joint Commission uh, indicated that pain assessment was a requirement, and this was focused on hospitals, but it flowed into the outpatient chronic care model so that we've been chasing pain as a pain intensity score, uh, which has led us down this uh, terrible uh, uh, rabbit hole of uh, patient disasters. And in fact, uh, in 2004, uh, Michael Cousins, uh, internationally uh, known, I think, specialist down in Australia, Dan Carr from my alma mater, Tufts, uh, identified pain relief as a universal human right. So we've been put under a lot of pressure. In fact, the AMA, 
uh, in 2004, uh, and I'll just highlight that the under-treatment of pain is a major societal issue, and I would say, yes, we've been under-treating it because we're not doing the right stuff. Uh, and instead, they call out that our fear of using opioids is the problem. If we just were a little more comfortable doling out the opioids, uh, we'd do a good job. So there's a huge pressure on us, really, to do the wrong thing without any evidence uh, to, frankly, support this. So what's happened? Uh, here is uh, a 20-year plot of uh, the, back in 1991, something happened in this area. This is where more permissive uh, prescribing laws were introduced. I was a participant in, from 95 to 96 in the rewriting of the Washington State laws, which allowed me to prescribe opiates for my 60-year-old man with renal insufficiency uh, and bad knees, and he couldn't take NSAIDs, and I can give him a couple of hydrocodone a day. Actually, back then we were using codeine, which is one-tenth the potency of hydrocodone, uh, knowing the dose of potencies is important. Uh, so we were doing that out, and I was basically committing a crime. Uh, and to change that, we actually had to rewrite the state laws. Uh, MS Cotton, first extended release uh, product, came out about 99. OxyContin came out in the early 2000s, and they settled a $694 million lawsuit claiming that it was less addicting than oxycodone. Uh, the immediate release, which obviously wasn't uh, something that we now experience. Uh, but internists uh, are prescribing quite a lot of opiates. Uh, this is the total outpatient prescriptions uh, in millions uh, that the internists are, are writing. You can see the other specialties. Uh, I spent a lot of time with, with uh, anesthesiologists in my current uh, joint appointment, uh, rehab doctors. And then the physician uh, extender groups, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, are who in most primary care audience I speak to nationally are the most popular group, most populated group in the room uh, because uh, people in rural clinics uh, push these unpleasant patients off down the rank of who can get to say who they see. So they're usually seeing most of the patients uh, with chronic pain. Uh, if you also track the trend between 2000 and 2010, uh, what's really happened in terms of non-malignant or non-cancer pain management over the decade, uh, that uh, the pain visits increased by 20%, non-opioids. So in other words, the alternatives to opiates remained unchanged, and opiate prescribing went up 73%. Uh, so this is a visit, any visit that is associated with the dispensing of pain medication uh, during that time. Uh, and uh, uh, well known by this audience now, but in case you haven't seen this slide, sales, deaths, and need for uh, addiction treatment management. And uh, right before we started, uh, the issue is how much does uh, opio how much does pain management uh, interact with addiction? My view is if your patient is struggling with addiction as a result of your treatment, that was your problem. You made the error of, of jumping in on this uh, because addiction and pain management uh, are just uh, unfortunately co-occurring. 30% incidence of addictive disorders are associated in pain population. And actually, Jane Ballantyne on our, on our faculty now over at Harborview, beautiful editorial uh, in the uh, journal Pain uh, on uh, the difficulty we have uh, because when you're an addict, you're seeking euphoria. Uh, when you're a patient with pain, you're seeking relief. And it has made us all completely confused as to how we can tell the difference between this problem. But we need to be able to tell that difference so we don't continue on this trend. Happy to say that uh, Washington State, uh, somewhat to our notoriety, uh, uh, earned the, the distinction uh, and now uh, positively, and the CDC said if every state in the country did what we did in Washington State in 2010, uh, there would not be the same opiate epidemic right now. Uh, there's 16,000 people die every year, 16,000 of prescription opiate. That's stuff that comes off physician and other uh, prescribers, uh, prescription authority. This isn't uh, heroin, uh, and very little of this is stolen and uh, 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 bartered around in, in, in regard to where pay patients get these drugs. Uh, we bent the curve, and, and, I, and I just learned that Florida is the second state to do it, and they shut down their pill mills, so they bent their curve. They were in the top 1% of, of opiate overdoses back then. Uh, this is uh, back in, uh, uh, there were some initial guidelines uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved in, and then there was a recommended education guideline, uh, and in 2011, uh, the state law said that you've got to follow the guidelines, uh, the Washington State guidelines, and now about uh, 40 states have guidelines, and they reference back the Washington State guidelines. So we've 
we've done a good job at bending this curve. Uh, we went from about 660 deaths in 09 in Washington State uh, down to about 380 last year. Uh, so our number of people dying of motor vehicle accident uh, more, uh, casualty is now more than accidental opioid overdose. For a while, we were again the first state that exceeded that. And now across the country, more people die of accidental overdoses uh, to prescription drugs than they die of car accidents. Uh, so not a sign of safer cars. I think it's just uh, uh, an issue about uh, the allure of opioids. Uh, so why do we like opioids? First, they make patients happy sometimes too happy, and that's the reason why you wouldn't want to prescribe. Patient reports euphoria, that's a number one risk that they're going to be in trouble. 80% uh, of patients feel lousy with opioids and will self-discontinue those opioids. Uh, and at least initially, because tolerance quickly develops, and I was taught it's all about tolerance, just push through tolerance, just raise the dose and keep going until you, know, you can get uh, your NRS and numeric rating score down low. Uh, and indeed, that does not happen. Uh, tolerance uh, to pain is short, uh, to analgesia is short lived and rapidly recurs. Tolerance to sedation is noted, so our patients aren't falling asleep. But tolerance to respiratory drive does not develop. So we think our patients are doing well, uh, but in fact, they stop breathing at night, and that's one of the biggest concerns. Uh, MED of about 200 uh, doubles the risk of central sleep apnea more prevalent than obstructive sleep apnea. The only treatment that I know, and I'm in a room of learned internists here, uh, for central sleep apnea is stopping the drugs that are causing that problem. And yet we're giving opioids and benzodiazepines uh, for reasons that are usually existential suffering uh, rather than uh, seeking analgesia. Uh, in uh, the Northwest, we have the privilege of uh, uh, being involved in the care of uh, our uh, uh, partners in uh, Alaska, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana. I understand that there may be some connected here, so thank you for joining us. Uh, but opiates are available everywhere. Every pharmacist will carry opiates. You can get opiates to anyone, anywhere, anytime. And uh, do you think you can get a behavioral health specialist who is familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy in the Kenai Peninsula? Send me an email and find out if one's available. Uh, it's hard to get them in here in Seattle, uh, let alone. Uh, so it's a whole lot easier. How about the physical therapist who understands chronic pain? is isn't just the sports medicine, do these exercises and go home. This is a specialty in all areas. Uh, insurance with perverse incentives covers opioids more than effective therapy. A uh, month's worth of OxyContin in high doses is about $1,200 to $1,600 a month. A multidisciplinary pain clinic, which has powerful evidence of efficacy, is about $18,000. Uh, so what we have in basically 16 months, we spent the entire budget with cost to treat this patient effectively, get them off these drugs, get them functional again. And yet insurance plans are much more happy to prescribe opiates in multidisciplinary pain clinics, physical therapy, Medicaid gets 10 visits a year. Can you imagine that, 10 visits a year, when that is a, one of the cheapest ways that we can improve functionality in our patients? And behavioral health, Medicaid doesn't cover it all. That's useful uh, and uh, completely ineffective. So perverse incentives are driving this. And again, the sign that prescription closes the visit. So how about non-medical use? What's the allure? The allure is that pain uh, relievers, uh, and these are again uh, almost exclusively opioids, uh, lead the pack in terms of uh, psychotropic drugs among uh, uh, people 12 or older. I just learned yesterday that uh, the incidence of uh, 12th graders uh, uh, using opiates uh, on a regular basis has dropped uh, from about 6% to 4%. 4% of our 12th graders are using opiates regularly. So where, so where, do, they, where do they get this? They get these drugs, and it's a complicated slide. Just a few are doctor shopping. You can see 1.8%. Most are coming from one doctor. Most are coming, quote, free from a friend or a relative. So that says, well, it's not us. We're, not, we're under 20%. Turns out, where do those people get the drugs? They get it from one doctor. Uh, so this is the opioid uh, 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 epidemic, uh, the flood of opioids that are being just distributed by us that have led to this problem. Uh, Mitch Katz, uh, uh, colleague uh, internist uh, from San Francisco, uh, wrote a, a very nice piece, uh, uh, and he says he's a believer who's lost his faith uh, in opioids. And how did this, that happen? First, I want to just call out that, uh, in case you're not aware, University of Washington was the first place that pain was seen as a condition meriting individualized special care. Pain is a disease unto itself. John Bonica, first chair of anesthesia, 
uh, whose clinic I rotated through as a second year resident because I knew I knew nothing about pain. And I was at Harborview, uh, and uh, I think that's Harborview's connected. I can't get a show of hands, but uh, when I asked the Harborview residents how many patients are there just prescribing opiates for, they say over half the practice. Uh, and I figured I need to learn something. And I worked with uh, Dr. Bonica and others uh, in their earlier careers. Uh, so we shifted from multidisciplinary pain clinics and multimodal analgesia more than just opioids to opioid unimodal analgesia. And I want to call this out. Uh, if you look at your patient's uh, uh, med list and they have a chronic pain disorder and the only agent you're using to manage their pain is an opioid, you're out of compliance. Uh, opioid monotherapy is not recommended by any agency currently. The American Pain Society, et cetera, have identified that opioid monotherapy is associated with societal harm, poor outcomes, and the cost of poor pain management, which is so focused on opiates, is $650 billion a year, more than heart disease, diabetes, and cancer combined. And the estimates are that that's not pediatric or institutionalized or veterans. That's just the civilian population. Uh, and uh, it's, the estimates are that half are wasted Frankly, from my perspective, 80% is wasted. So just look at those billions of dollars we can use to do something useful and effective for the health of our population. So we went from chronic pain to chronic opioids, dissatisfying encounters, over-reliance on these drugs, frustrated, dissatisfied patients, prescribers, health plans, health systems, and all this regulatory stuff that is, we are, none of us like being told how to practice medicine. So Dan Carr, uh, again, I'm going to quote him. Uh, he visited us last year at one of our lectures, a brilliant man, uh, uh, and uh, said, it's time for us to switch the original paradigm from the biopsychosocial, and as highlighted uh, in the opening comment, that what's unique about taking care of patients with pain, it's really the social psycho bio. Our job as uh, pain specialists and certainly as primary care internists is to get the bio down. You need to know what's going on. So you need to understand pain, so you can then teach your patients. There's some early work being published from Australia. Uh, uh, I, I reviewed a, a preliminary manuscript that, that stated that if the clinician understands pain, treatment outcomes are 60% improvement in the patient. That's, I mean, if you just get it, patients know you get it, and they will respond to your treatments much more effectively. So it's worth understanding pain. Uh, but it also, the social and the psychological background cannot be overlooked. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I think primary care folks have a specific talent in being able to manage this problem. Uh, this is a way too complicated slide, but I, I just brought this out that if you apply measurement-based step care, which is big, uh, you know, step one, function, referral pattern. So how do you refer people through care pathways? Uh, this uh, we, was published in a, a clinical update in uh, uh, IASP, International Association for Study of Pain. Uh, and what this calls out is, I, I just want you to notice, Pain appears once in my title here. There's nowhere in chronic pain that you need to actually measure the pain intensity. Uh, we put it in the notes. We have to do it for meaningful use, et cetera. It doesn't help you at all because pain intensity alone is inadequate in chronic pain. If you're chasing that number, you're going to end up on very dissatisfied, as will the patient. So you need to understand and explain to the patient it's all about function. 60% uh, of patients with chronic pain are depressed. 70% in our clinic have an anxiety disorder, and we are a tertiary clinic, and 70% of both men and women uh, have been sexually abused, have had such a traumatic life that they score positive on PTSD screen. So we're treating people with PTSD, severe depression and anxiety, with high dose of opiates and benzos, uh, and we wonder why the outcomes aren't looking so good and why we don't want to see these patients in our practice. Function, mood, sleep, Benzos and opioids are contraindicated. Look at your med list. If you're on that combination, change it uh, because uh, you're out of guideline compliance. Uh, treatment adherence, uh, again, important to monitor for patients on opioids and the opiate uh, equivalent dose helps you understand because as the dose goes up, every risk factor increases. And in fact, some uh, work uh, that uh, Dr. Mark Sullivan and our faculty from the Department of Psychiatry have published uh, with Edland and others have identified that the highest dose opioids is correlated uh, to 260% probability that patients high dose opiates also have co-occurring addiction and co-occurring major psychiatric diagnosis. So this is the population who is on these doses. So if you want to screen, in my view, it's not been done, 
for patients with addiction disorder and co-occurring psychiatric disease. Just look at the MED. Uh, and if it's up over 200 or so, that's probably the diagnosis that you have overlooked uh, because, uh, or have inherited for the trainees who are just you know, walking into complicated practices. So chronic care model, uh, I put this up uh, because, not because this audience isn't familiar with it, uh, but only uh, that I've used this similar slide deck to talk to uh, pain specialists. It's coordinated, it's collaborative, it involves evidence-based monitoring. Uh, I want to highlight self-management the goal of any chronic illness is improving patient self-management. I think that's, we can get a clear consensus in this group. Uh, and it's similarly in pain uh, because our ability to reduce pain intensity with all our drugs is no better than 30% reduction in pain intensity score. Uh, and I'll give you some data about when you focus on the other, uh, other goals, how well you do. We're using a tool uh, called Pain Tracker. Um, and it's been banging around in an outside EMR. And I see Dr. Uh, David Chu up there, and uh, he knows a little bit about our appeals to get into the EMR here. But it's a web-based tool that allows us to track over time what the patient's response is. These vertical lines are uh, specific treatments. It gives us the opiate risk tool, the alcohol risk tool, a pH codine, a suicide ideation, screens for PTSD, sleep apnea, and uh, identifies uh, right before I even start the visit. So in that six minutes I have as a primary care person, I like to get the data up front. It's like a cardiologist that your patient is seeing without a blood pressure, a pulse, a BMI, an EKG, or any labs. Uh, and you have to collect all that in the course of your six minutes. It can't be done. So you need this data up front when you walk in the room so you can start making clinical decisions. And uh, that we do as physicians, not collecting data, uh, which cannot be done on the web. So again, uh, back to triple aim. There's no question that chronic pain is a chronic disease. That was why I was so interested in embedded chronic pain into my uh, practice with other chronic diseases uh, for my 27 years before I joined the U here at full time. We can improve the experience. Uh, we can improve health outcomes, no question about that. And we can certainly reduce costs. So we hit uh, the target three ways. Uh, length of stay, emergency department use, readmissions, costly medication, low-value treatments, unnecessary imaging, and surgery to cut out uh, existential suffering. I've never seen that accomplished uh, successfully to date. Uh, so the outpatient collaborative care model, uh, we've instituted with the neighborhood clinics. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Pete McGuff, uh, who's been a, a leader on this, and uh, uh, Patty Reed Williams, who's one of the family medicine folks out in Issaquah. Uh, no tracking, no outcome measurement, and getting care required a, a specialty clinic consultation, uh, which unfortunately we are still understaffed. Uh, numbers to next new in our clinic are now three months, sadly, uh, and it's a big challenge. The average length of time it takes for patients to show up in a pain clinic is seven years. So if you want a, someone with heart disease to really show up in class four, uh, uh, congestive failure, wait seven years before you do anything correct to manage them. So it's early interventions are necessary. So we instituted a registry. It was already actually started in the clinics. It was an opiate registry, targeted those patients, used the, this pain tracker tool uh, in their clinic, coordinated with uh, an uh, RN who is a care manager in our clinic, coordinated and managed and educated uh, them. And now the neighborhood clinics uh, from in 2009, we don't see pain patients. The signs were up on the doors. We don't prescribe pain medicine. They're going for NCQA tier three certification as a medical home in pain. Can you believe it? In just those few years, they're able to turn a disaster into no problem at all. Understanding what you're doing, keeping track and following this like an ordinary disease. Uh, Steve Dobson down in Portland at the Veterans. Again, the VA has done a great job. They've done a, a fair amount of publication on collaborative care. So for the sake of time, Conclusion of this study, it was a cluster randomized trial. A little bit of clinician education, or patient assessment, activation, symptom management, feedback and recommendations uh, to the clinicians and facilitation of specialty care. Uh, this is a Roland Morris disability. Uh, it, it, it nudged down. It wasn't as powerful as we'd like to see, but all statistically significant improvements with this collaborative intervention. Uh, Working with uh, Dr. Unitzer, uh, Chair of Psychiatry, with his brilliant uh, behavioral health integration program. Uh, this is what published in the American Journal of Managed Care 08. Uh, you could see that the cost of their program was called Impact. It was about a little over $500. Uh, 
Uh, but if you look at the healthcare costs in this uh, 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 prospective trial that was conducted, there's a reduction in terms of saving of 6.5 to 1 ROI. If you track more than RVU per square foot, it's a complicated model by just coordinating care. We, at the neighborhood clinics, uh, identified uh, the population that were being referred to us. It was this pilot study. Uh, we're working on a larger manuscript now on this. I uh, showed that about a third of our patients were not interested in getting well. These are the patients for whom I really wonder whether we should be spending as much time on. About a third were actually ready to get well, and these are the folks we should concentrate on. And a third that were well engaged, this is, oh, well, this, we dropped our pain intensity 6%. Now, this is why we don't track pain intensity. Disability down 45%, anxiety, depression down nearly 50%, and the opiate use, the morphine equivalent dose, almost 60% reduction in this population. By just doing those simple things that we outlined, it's not high tech, and any internist can learn how to do this. So we've got a, a, a model of pain uh, consultation right now that uh, when I joined the uh, faculty here, I said, but uh, your customer, when they show up at the pain clinic, is the primary care doctor. Uh, because if you do a good job with their patient, you'll be doing a good service for the primary care doctor. I came in with the pure attitude of the of a primary care doctor, take care of our primary care doctor. So we created three tiers. One, just take a look, the patient's having trouble, you don't feel comfortable, we'll take a look and reassure, I'd say about 20%, 25% of our consults, are you doing okay? This is a difficult problem. Uh, you've got things lined up pretty well and keep at it, a pat in the back. Uh, uh, about 50% we tweak because there's a bunch of stuff that hasn't been done. The diagnosis is uncertain. Multimodal analgesia has not been offered. Uh, the opiate dose is too high, and we can help them uh, manage that. And we provide a straightforward care plan. And then about 15% of patients stick around for three to six months while we do the heavy lifting and get them back to you improved. We send them back to you unimproved. We're not doing our job as consultants. And we had a pretty good culture change uh, in, in the clinic uh, as a result of that. Uh, so, do biopsychosocial treatments work for chronic pain? Uh, I just want to give you, I didn't give you all the detailed references here, uh, but I ran out of space on the page to describe the number of studies that show that behavioral health management, and particularly cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, for trainees, how do you know your patient's getting cognitive behavioral therapy when they say they're seeing a therapist? I ask them if they're doing homework. Not doing homework, it's not CBT, it's psychodynamic, for which there's no evidence for that. It's like physical therapy without home exercises. You know, through the home exercises, it's not therapy, it's not going to work. Uh, how about for efficacy of multidisciplinary chronic pain programs? Again, overwhelming evidence of, of efficacy. Uh, recently, uh, fairly recently published, Bob Gatchel um, and um, Akiko Okifuji uh, published healthcare costs. This is cost effectiveness, conventional treatment, which is the crappy care we're now giving, uh, compared to a chronic pain program, you can see you've reduced the cost over $100,000 uh, and reduced disability uh, uh, by a substantial percent as well. Uh, review clearly demonstrates that chronic pain programs offer the most efficacious and cost-effective evidence-based treatment for persons with chronic pain. Uh, the UW shut its chronic pain program down in 2006 because no one would pay. Insurance companies wouldn't pay for the multidisciplinary care. Again, those perverse incentives, they'd rather pay for useless interventions and high-dose opiates rather than what, what, what's truly effective. Very, very frustrating. Uh, Institute of Medicine, finally, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, requirement was the uh, IOM was instructed to produce a report because of the pain problem in America. Uh, let's do something about it. Uh, and mandated, again, just read the list. It's still it's the chronic care illness model. Let's just apply the chronic care illness model of it, and they called, literally, in the title of the report, Transforming uh, Pain Care. Uh, so we're, we're doing a little bit of this stuff now. Uh, Harvard is going to roll to the medical center shortly. Uh, we're working now using our pain tracker type tools uh, and additional information to identify high-risk pain, poor pain outcomes. So we now can predict who's going to do poorly after surgery in terms of pain control. Uh, and then identify selected care pathways uh, that are associated with that. Here's a impossible to read uh, schematic, but I want to call out here. Here's the, it probably should be a, women, a woman because most primary care providers now are 
female, but we, the graphic here is a man and the patient using a pain tracker. We feed the patient back the data so they're involved in the results. Refer to surgeon, need for pain expertise, telepain or a formal consult. Then identify the risk, triage to low, medium, high, create the care pathway associated with this, and the patients are brought back down to planet Earth uh, before they go back to your practice as far as dosing and complexity of care. And then, astonishingly, we're gonna see whether the surgery was worth it. So we're gonna do a pain tracker at the beginning, pain tracker one week, one month, six months, and one year later to see if the surgery was worth it. And some data supports that uh, when you query patients for elective, some of the orthopedic, mostly spine surgeries, the patients say they're really no better, and in fact, they're far worse, and we want to get some re real data on this. So the Institute of Medicine uh, lists a series of principles. Here's the moral imperative, and I agree, it is a moral imperative to, to treat our patients properly, but I don't think it's a moral imperative to load them up with uh, opiates and benzos. Uh, chronic pain, recognize that it's a disease unto itself and you may not find objective evidence, but the brain is abnormal, and that's a whole lecture about how the central nervous system, you could see with high, more advanced imaging, how disturbed the brain responds to non-noxious stimuli after a period of uh, chronic pain and sensitization. Value of comprehensive treatment, interdisciplinary assessment, prevention, wider use of existing knowledge. We know enough now to make a big difference. We don't have to have any new breakthroughs in the basic science, it'd be great to have more effective treatments, but just what we know, they asked uh, us to solve the conundrum of opioids, uh, we're working on that. Uh, identifying roles for the patients, in other words, get them involved in the care, and then a public health and community-based approach, uh, recognize that there are large numbers of people, and this is a public health uh, concern as well. Uh, Part of the ACA said after the IOM gives a report, uh, we're gonna do what they say. The IOM said we have to have a national pain strategy. And this is my first ask of uh, my colleagues here. Uh, it just was published, there's the link. Read through it, provide your comments. Uh, because this is a chance uh, for getting an internist in the room. It was mentioned that I'm usually, and thank you for mentioning that, I, I was surprised by the introduction. And I find myself usually the only internist in the room and I've heard, boy, it's good to have an internist in the room uh, because you know what? We understand chronic diseases and complex uh, illnesses that are interacting and the social and psychological environment that's because we're spending time in, in, uh, in the uh, primary care setting. Uh, so this will get you at least in the room of discussion about comments. Please take a look at that. It'd be great to get uh, useful feedback. I pulled out one of, you can see they give a bunch of domains here uh, and it's, I had all of the domains that listed in objectives, would never get through that, but here's just one that I pulled out, service delivery and reimbursement, obviously important uh, for any healthcare system, how are we gonna get paid and what are we gonna deliver? Again, if you, if you haven't heard it already, it's integrated, multimodal, and interdisciplinary care. Evidence-based science that's involved in our practice uh, through incentives that are aligned with good care, outcomes, cost, and uh, outcome assessment. assessment. High quality, coordinated pain care through an integrated biopsychosocial approach. So this, again, is pretty straightforward. I don't think anyone would have much of an argument. I had the uh, privilege of working with the National Pain Strategy, and I think it's a pretty good document, but take a look. Get involved in that, uh, and here's another opportunity. Uh, uh, in, just coming up next month, the American Pain Society, it's gonna be in uh, Palm Springs. Uh, not so bad, uh, but uh, Jessica Merlin uh, from Alabama, she trained in the Northeast and was calling me from Alabama. She's a, a general uh, academic internist there. And she was in Alabama, it was such a disaster uh, in the pain service there. She took uh, some initiative and formed a primary care, a special interest group in this organization. Uh, and we put together uh, a number of experts and we, we, we have a full afternoon workshop that we're gonna be involved in. Uh, uh, managing as well as a SIG group. And again, for those of you who come, I'd say it's not only good to have them in the room, but it's good to have them at the table. Uh, so come join us at the table here uh, to have a discussion uh, that may advance the agenda of primary care because uh, we, they're getting it out there, just starting to get what a burden it is on our practice. Uh, but uh, it's uh, certainly uh, solutions are really ready at hand. Some uh, questions, why would an internist get extra credentials in pain specialty? Uh, I grandfathered in uh, because uh, I couldn't take the American Board of Anesthesia exam, uh, which is a true qualifying exam. Uh, 
it, because it, it, it applied only to anesthesia, rehab medicine, uh, and neurology and psychiatry. I should say psychiatry gets two hours in their entire residency in pain. Uh, so whether they're more qualified than an internist to sit for the board is an open question. Emergency medicine jumped in. Uh, so now emergency medicine uh, residents can take, do a fellowship and then do pain boards. And family medicine also jumped in uh, so that a family medicine provider can do a pain fellowship and then sit for the boards. It requires uh, the uh, American Board of Internal Medicine to say, we will attest to your qualifications as an internist, and then you, one can do a fellowship. We've had zero fellows in our pain clinic coming from primary care specialties to date, and it's a darn shame because it's always good to have an internist in the room. I gotta tell you, it really, it really makes a difference. Uh, other options, uh, but I did the American Board of Pain Medicine because that was my only option. Uh, you can do American Board of Pain Management. Uh, it's not terribly rigorous, and I would say it's not very scientific at all. And there's an opportunity. I know uh, 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 we learned a little bit about the internal medicine anesthesia combined. It's a four-year residency that's available now in uh, UC Davis. Scott Fishman will be here next week. If you're interested in talking about that, and you would qualify for the board at that point. Uh, so quick summary. I certainly can't have you understand pain. I think you understand why you're in distress. But remember, uh, pain care is not treating opiates for the fifth vital sign. It's not just about opiates. My pet peeve is it's conversations, a lot of these pain is all about opiates. Let's find a better opioid delivery system. It's just way too much focus on opiates when it's, they're really not effective. As we now know there's no evidence that they're effective for, in any meaningful way and certainly at high dose. Uh, and it's certainly not about managing misuse and addiction. Uh, that's a problem that you will encounter in your practice, but if that's the problem, it's not pain, it's addiction management. Uh, and you need to just reframe your discussion and get the patients in their proper care. Pain is a chronic multidimensional illness. It's disabling not only to patients and practices, but we can see communities in general uh, from the uh, outflow of opiates uh, to our uh, uh, youth and others. It requires a structured assessment and tracking. I mean, it's, uh, diabetes is a complicated illness. I think it's way more complicated than managing chronic pain. Uh, because you know how to do it. You've been taught. There's a structure. You do this, you follow this lab, you track it at this point. Pain is, frankly, easier to do and a lot more straightforward. And because there's so few of us doing it out there, it's enormously satisfying uh, to be able to accomplish. I asked the medical students uh, in fourth year, so they're on their way out the door, entering practice. Two of them got to rotate with me in the pain clinic. Uh, and I say, end of the month, okay, I'm gonna, I've already graded you. Yet, but I say that. Uh, tell me what you learned. Uh, and uh, they say two things that are absolutely consistent. The first is these pain patients are really nice. What does that mean? That's that hidden curriculum. Now, these people are just really good people, and they're just been bashed around in the system. Uh, so they don't be, they don't look nice, but you just like an onion, the rosier onion. You cook them a long time, they sweeten up. Uh, uh, you cry when you start, uh, but they're really nice. And the students say that every single student says that. So what does that say about our education? What does that say about their learning here at the University of Washington? That these are dirt balls and drug addicts and malingerers. It's just a terrible attitude. Of course, we're not going to like our care or respond to our care. The second thing they say, and this is what I'm hoping you'll come out, they say there is something you can do for these patients. What an amazing thing. No wonder we're not satisfied. If there's nothing you can do, why would you want to be involved in that practice? So the fact that uh, we, we're making some headway here is, to me, enormously satisfying. And I would say when done well, pain care done well, is absolutely and extremely satisfying. So I'm going to open this to questions. I'm going to leave this up as a backdrop. This is uh, available through the UW Internet. Uh, the intranet and open to anyone, uh, anywhere in the United States, uh, our pain medicine provider toolkit. Everything I've talked about is listed here. All these tools uh, can be downloaded as PDFs. It's a great reference site. We try to keep it updated. It's, it needs another update, but this is a, the last screenshot I, I had on that. So uh, I think we may have some time for questions. Really, thanks everyone for your attention. Hi, I'm Peter Byers. I'm sorry I missed the first part of your talk, but do you think there's a genetic component to uh, 
uh, chronic pain? Are there people who are genetically susceptible, and uh, do they fall into particular categories? Yes. The question is, is there a genetic component? Yes. Uh, there's wide variability uh, in uh, p patients' response to noxious stimuli. Uh, family history is very important uh, in identifying that. There are some clusters of diseases, particularly fibromyalgia runs uh, in, in very high uh, familial clusters. It's hard to sort out what the epigenetic events and exposures uh, uh, people will have, and that often comes from the social and environmental lives that people live. Uh, the highest risk for developing uh, chronic pain is uh, having an early childhood adverse experience, the adverse childhood experience sequence of uh, the mother treated violently, uh, sexually abused, uh, someone in the house incarcerated, someone abusing drugs in the house, and that's a, a fabulous predictor of uh, development of chronic pain. There's uh, also opioid metabolism has some role, and I don't, again, I don't want to talk too much about opiates, and pay attention if you're being told that by your patient that they have a 2D6 uh, uh, hypermetabolizer, I say, uh, and therefore they, they have to have more oxycodone, I say congratulations, uh, you metabolize to oxymorphone, which is opana, which is twice as effective, so I should lower your dose. Uh, uh, so you need to be informed, and if they're a hypometabolizer, I say, well, this is great. I can give you half the dose because it's hanging around a long time. So uh, we're getting, hearing a lot of nonsense from the urine drug testing people and the genetic screening people that this means something clinically. It is so far from prime time uh, right now. There's also a congenital insensitivity to pain syndrome. These are children who are born without functioning nociceptors, uh, and these children don't survive past teenage years because pain is something we need. It's diabetic... Uh, from neuropathy and ulcers and amputations, we all know in medicine. So without pain system alarm, uh, you hurt yourself and uh, bite yourself and burn yourself. Uh, and there are variants within uh, people's uh, sensitivity uh, to pain. Uh, there is work being done on that, uh, and I think it's well worth pursuing. But I think my view is the first thing to do is just fix our practices so we, we don't feel disabled by managing pain. All right. to address public expectations. Uh, I, I think the pharmaceutical industry, um, the pain uh, specialists have sort of oh, 20 years ago really set expectations that we would be treating pain. And you're telling us, I think appropriately, we should be aiming for improving function. Pain may or may not get better. But public expectation is still very high. And what, what's being done to address that now? Well, I just put up here, it's, here's, I, I saved these slides expecting a question. Uh, it's being addressed. It, it needs to be uh, uh, considered. Uh, it's lagging behind, uh, generally speaking. There's a, a, a communication uh, to the public right now is coming from primary care providers' offices. Again, the people are seeing patients with pain. And I think at this point, the, the lame public, ed public education program we have right now is this audience uh, and the audiences that are listening uh, from, from streaming in terms of uh, acknowledging that you know, I'm not going to cure your pain. We you never cure chronic pain. Uh, I'm not focusing on pain intensity. I'm focusing on function and your quality of life. And let's manage that like we would do with any other chronic illness. Uh, uh, so there's not a, a currently a structured public campaign. NIH is trying to do it. I think there's the American pain the American Chronic Pain Association, by the way, great site, American Chronic Pain Association, is not industry funded uh, and is absolutely squeaky clean and gives great resources to uh, provide uh, to our patients. Uh, and there's a great little film clip from Australia. It's called Understand Pain in Less Than Five Minutes. YouTube it. Uh, put it in the office. Uh, for those who did medical school here, they get to watch it twice. And once in their second year and once in their fourth year, so it reinforces it's four minutes and 50 sec seven seconds long. Uh, and it's great. It says, really, everything you need to know about pain in, in a nice overview. But that's about where we're at right now. So I think it is a key component. And they'll respond. This isn't good enough, Mark, in, in your response <laughs> to the National Pain Society. Uh, how are we going to be able to accomplish that? Because setting expectations is critical. Uh, and we set the expectations right when they walk in, in the office, uh, and we should maintain consistency across the board on that. You. David, how do we get the insurance industry involved in this? Well, the finances seem so clear. Okay. Uh, how do we get the... <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, I, I first, I went, my first response is the uh, accountable... Uh, 
uh, care network and accountable care organizations get it. They recognize this is, these are the 10% of patients that consume 80% as a, as a complex uh, chronic illness. Uh, they're getting it, they're swarming around systems that have uh, better pain care management. Uh, it's not clear to me how to improve funding. We are still fighting the same battle every day. They don't authorize the drug as a woman who's got the overlapping, she's a uh, scleroderma. I mean, she's got, Mark would be interested, she's auto-amputating all her fingertips. She's got real severe uh, nociceptive pain. But she can't control her opioids, so I want to put her on a little Suboxone, which is the safe way of managing this disorder. Well, she's Medicaid. She doesn't have addiction disorder. She's pain disorder. No funding whatsoever. Uh, so it was a blow up in the clinic uh, yesterday. The PA took care of it. God bless the PA. We, <laughs> they do all the heavy lifting. Uh, and uh, it was a storm, and they were going to sue me and the university and probably my both my chairs, they'll be prepared uh, for abandoning her and doing all the wrong things. Uh, but it's impossible. It really is impossible. Uh, uh, Dan Lessler, who many of us know and, and love, he's uh, they're running HCA now, the medical director of HCA, and uh, I'm working with him about every two weeks about how we can make these system changes. Uh, and I think the way it's going to probably start is uh, through the uh, accountable care organizations because they, they are just paying attention to the, to the bottom line. Because it's a systems issue. We don't save the money. Every time I see, if I see a patient, I lose money for the university. My time is just more expensive than, than uh, the outcome to the system. If you screen it out over the entire system in terms of ER use, length of stay when they go to the hospital, cost of drugs, uh, overutilization of other services, plugging up the other offices where they could, patients could be better benefited, the surgical offices, it's a huge system advantage. Uh, the program at Harborview, we've costed it out. At three years, we expect to have 1% profit. Uh, and we're hiring 14 staff, not a single physician. So it's not that expensive. We're hiring 14 staff acupuncturists. Uh, we've got the chaplains going to help. This is the biopsycho, this is the psychosocial model. Lots of uh, behavioral health. We have uh, counselors and the like, uh, because I think the oldest treatment we've ever had uh, for pain, uh, this is a, something I enjoy uh, teaching the trainees. The oldest treatment ever is rubbing. We do that every time we get hurt. We rub it. It's probably how TENS units works and probably how spinal cord stems work. And it's a chicken and the egg thing. What's the other oldest? Hugs. So hugs and rubs is cheaper than a uh, Narcan event from an overdose of uh, benzos and opioids. And we're going to prove it. I'm convinced uh, it's going to work. It's our hypothesis. And, we're going to collect the data and exceed our 1% ROI at, at, uh, at three years. And we're going to roll that system-wide if we get the whole university support on this. we got a few more minutes. Can I ask one question, actually? Uh, of course. You talked about the 30% of patients who have this overlap of chronic pain and addiction. As you, as you start thinking about these future directions, is there... I just think of the fact that as little pain education as we got during in med school and residency, we got even less addiction education during medical school and residency. Are there plans to tie this together as a unified movement? Okay, so uh, every pa Washington State guidelines require you when the patient is going to be on chronic meds, opioids, at 90 days, uh, if you're going to continue to probably have to do an opiate risk tool, 10 question item, the tool is high, very simple. High risk for misuse and addiction versus marginal benefits, not a candidate for opiates. Doesn't make patients happy. Uh, if, if you say, well, there's nothing else I can do for you. But if you could think of all the other things we can do to help manage these, uh, these, these patients, we can do a huge amount. It's a difficult conversation, but if you don't understand it, you cannot communicate this to your patients. I'm successful at it because I've been doing this a long time. Uh, I got some gray hair, what's left of it, and it's clear that I'm an old guy and they believe me. So it's harder for younger trainees to be able to communicate your wisdom and knowledge uh, about this. But if at least you get it, you can look the patient in the eye and say, I understand how much you're suffering, how much distress you have. Let's talk about ways we can remedy this because opiates are not safe for you. They're just not a safe drug. I would, I would frame it. NSAIDs for a patient with a creatinine of 2.2, there's no conversation, is there? I'd say, I'd look at this like an NSAID question. Are the risks 
and see the benefits, and absolutely yes. Uh, and so we can, if the patient has an addiction problem that we can diagnose, uh, they need to see an addiction specialist and not be managed by you unless you, you're planning on uh, specializing or, or having a special interest area in addiction. Thank you.